panel discussion coming up, and for this, instead of the five minute to go cards, because I'm only asking them for five minute contributions, I'm bringing back the yellow and red cards. <laughs> so yellow means one minute to go, please canter towards the finish. Red means your time's up, please stop at the end of the next sentence. I'm telling you this again because I will not hesitate to use this on contributions from the floor. <laughs> where the timing will be entirely a matter of my own judgment. And if I feel you've been going on too long, you'll get a red, yellow card. And if I feel you've ignored that and continued to go on too long, you'll get a red card and everyone in the room will glare at you. Uh, that's, that's, I think, the worst sanction anyone can think of. Um, so the, the panel for this panel discussion, they're going to give five-minute introductions. Uh, just to lay out some initial thoughts, and then we'll just come back to you. I will probably do what I normally do at this kind of event, which is that I will take two or three contributions at a time, and then come back and let the panel answer things that they want to answer, rather than one person expresses something, all four of you answer, we go out again, because then that <coughs> should maximise your contribution, and also a bit of a better balance between you guys and, and these guys here. Um, that, so that's, that's what I plan to do. Also, as I said before, don't try and shoehorn your opinions into the form of a question. This is a discussion. Just have opinions. Just express them pithily and politely. That's all I ask. So, uh, I am going to start with, I'm, I'll introduce all of the panel and then, and then I'll hand over to the first one to start. So, in the order in which I'm going to get to speak, we have Ed Humperson from the Office for Statistics for Regulation. Nick Holliman from King's College London, uh, Mark Woolhouse, am I saying your name right? Is it not like Woolhouse or something? <laughs> no, okay, good. Mark Woolhouse from the University of Edinburgh, and finally Sarah Rasmussen, that also said right. Yeah, good. From the University of Cambridge, I hear. So, uh, so first of all, your five minutes starts now. Ed. Feel free to stand up or sit down, whichever you prefer. Thank you very much. Uh, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, who here has got a tote bag with them? Has anybody got a tote bag? I'd like to see a show of hands from tote bag. Okay, I'd like, anybody's willing to, could you show me what your tote bag says on it? <laughs> the, the, the person right at the back there. What, is it, what does your tote bag say? <laughs> oh, very good, very good. It's, I, was, I was expecting words, no words. Uh, and then Tom here, I can't read that. What does that say? Nothing. Words and pictures. And what do, what do the words say? Uh, it says words on pictures. It says words on pictures. <laughs> words on pictures are very good. And my, I'm looking for things which might help me do my talk. DNA. <laughs> uh, DNA. That might be quite good for my talk. Oh, man. Turn around, David. Turn around. Turn around. No, no, you. You turn your head around. Look, look, look here. Look. Look, look, look. Oh, I'm really there. Oh, great. So, somebody's actually got an on message back. Could you read out what your bag says? Um, what David keeps telling us at the Lincoln Centre. The first rule of communication is shut up and listen. Very good, very good. So first rule of communication is shut up and listen. My tote bag actually is from the Winton Centre too. It is want to be trusted, be trustworthy. Uh, and um, I just ha happen to have another one here which says uh, I'm confidently uncertain. I'm confidently uncertain. So I'm a regulator, and regulation involves making judgments, in my case, making judgments about the way statistics are produced and used. Uh, and in order to make judgments, you need evaluative criteria. Uh, I'm going to take my evaluative criteria from uh, our tote bags. I'm going to not really bring in much VNA, maybe a, bit, a little bit of words and pictures, uh, but mostly uh, I am uh, confidently uncertain. Uh, if you want to be trusted, be trustworthy. And the first rule of communication, shut up and listen. And I'm going to apply those evaluative criteria to uh, the keynote bits of communication of statistics in the pandemic. And I'm going to have just three examples very quickly. Uh, the first example is the COVID dashboard, the daily COVID dashboard. The second is the daily press briefings, the daily COVID press briefings. And the third is... Um, a slightly am amorphous uh, set of things which I'm calling broader policy communication. Um, and uh, uh, spoiler alert, that's my bucket for putting in lots of things I didn't like. Um, so let me start with uh, uh, the COVID dashboard. I'm going to give that three stars out of possible three because uh, the COVID dashboard uh, was um, absolutely trustworthy. 
The Daily Thing came out every day without fail at four o'clock. Um, it was easy to see the sources of the data. It was easy to drill down into those sources. Uh, and if there was a mistake with them, they very quickly and very transparently uh, corrected the error. So star there. Um, I'm afraid I can't hold up your, your bag, but it, the shut up and listen bag, um, the shut up and listen bag, they did that. They did a lot of listening. Uh, they, um, they engaged a lot with Twitter. When people suggested changes, bring more things in, they did that. The dashboard evolved. Um, they, they did indicate where there was some uncertainty. Quite hard to do in the dashboard idiom, but I think good enough to, to, to earn them their third star. So three stars. The daily press briefings, I'm going to give two stars to. Uh, I'm going to give it uh, a, a star for being um, I'm uh, confidently uncertain, uh, because one of the great things about the way that the data were communicated was there was a lot of explanation about what things were not known. Very, very good for that. Um, and I think being trustworthy was plenty of evidence of doing the same things in a repeated way, same time, same structure. Um, Martin Rouse talks about the same structure of graphs uh, very well yesterday. Uh, on the shut up and listen, I think the medium of the press briefings is probably not very conducive to that. It's a very broadcast, it's a very show and tell. Um, so maybe I'm not going to give it a star there. So two stars there. Broader policy communication, and here I'm thinking of things like we're going to do 100,000 tests a day, or uh, this is how many millions of tests we've, uh, we've, we've, we've commissioned, or, or indeed we've heard about recent worst case scenarios, and I was going to give a little bit of a tour of those, but I think Tom handles those extremely well, so I'll, I'll, I'll take those off. And I think in that use of data, that kind of broader, we've got, we've got some numbers which show that our policy is on track kind of communication. I'm going to give no stars at all, <laughs> because it, it demonstrates, I think, one of the real fallacies in a policymaker's mind that um, conveying a certain kind of command of numbers uh, is a way of weaponizing data in order to persuade and bombard your audience. Uh, and that's a really poor way of using numbers. And I think in all of those examples that I've given, you can see that sort of, that sort of pounding away with a single number robs the number of its context, its meaning, and its value for the audience. So I'm going to give it no stars. It's not confidently uncertain. Uh, it's not trustworthy, uh, and it's not uh, shutting up and listening. So those are my evaluative criteria. Those are my star rating systems. Lovely to, lovely to hear what you're thinking of all that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Yeah, so, Nick, you're you're final Um, and, and by evidencing what works, what I mean is we run global studies on uh, theoretical predictions of what should work and empirically validate that they do work. And um, while a lot of the time, uh, and many of the visualizations I've done have been to entertain and engage people, if you ever want to do that, situate your work in cosmology. Everybody in the world seems to like cosmology. Um, <laughs> Uh, a, a lot of the studies we've done have been more around command and control and decision making. So when you've got a, a group of commanders in the field, we did some of this work with Ronnie Brooks, as I mentioned this morning at, at DSL, and you want to be sure they all get the same message, you want to control their minds in effect, which is a bit of a scary thing for social scientists, but you want to control their minds so they all receive the same message. How can we validate that they will receive that same message or hope that they will receive that same message? Uh, and you shouldn't trust their mind or your mind to do that. Um, I can't show you, sadly, but I show the Juniper Consortium a whole range of visual illusions which will uh, break your uh, trust in your own mind if you uh, watch them for too long. Um, so, evidence in what works. So I thought what was interesting this week, I shall reflect slightly critically on what I saw this week. I, I didn't see anyone mention evidence for any of the communication methods that were talked about, apart from Ms. Hannah still here maybe. She said that she'd done some user studies, but she didn't relate back any evidence to that. And I think uh, while you can be very enthusiastic and very engaging with uh, communication and visualization, 
you also have to be careful to make sure that they've worked uh, and, and come back and, and, and you can literally do a recall exams afterwards, a couple of weeks to see if these things work. And I know the Winton Centre did some of these things quite thoroughly at times with global studies, but there was no evidence this week about that and it would be quite nice to see that. Um, and one of my frustrations with many of the modellers during the pandemic was that they were presenting very well evidenced models, very scientific evidence, but they didn't evidence, uh, they, they, in fact, were not interested in hearing about evidence about whether their visualisation methods were working. They, they, were, they were quite certain they were. Uh, and you can ask me about log scales later if you want to hear some more evidence on that. Okay. Um, so, um, some of this came out of work with GSCL, as I said, and we've come up with a, a four panel method for presenting. Uh, a whole range of limitations around data and more, more insight into data than could be presented very often during the pandemic. Uh, and I presented that to Juniper, and I think they tell me, Chris and uh, Julia told me they found that useful afterwards. Uh, and to go back to where this is situated, um, I would strongly encourage you to engage with psychologists. Someone couldn't believe why, but <laughs> psychologists study vision science, visual perception, and cognition. And, and, and have years and years and years of understanding of what works and what doesn't work. Uh, and just don't repeat their science uh, without the same depth that they, they've done. That would be my advice. Uh, we tried to engage with Test and Trace at one point. Um, test and Trace were very keen for us to engage with them. However, it became a confidentiality nightmare. They couldn't even share with us a synthetic version of Test and Trace data. So we spent months waiting for this to appear, and uh, unfortunately it never did. I got one small diagram which could have been improved had we had the time and uh, data. So, I think looking forward, if, if I'm... How many minutes have I got? You've got about two minutes left. Oh, excellent. I can talk for ages. <laughs> looking forward, I think, to, to focus on what could be done better in communication of anything, but particularly mathematical models and their outcomes. Um, there's two directions you can go. One of the most successful things I've done is a set of 3D models of a cosmologist called uh, Carlos Frank, which we turned into stereo 3D movies. Um, and the mathematics behind the dark matter cosmology of the universe, I have, I've looked at the papers, I have no idea what it does, but we were able to turn those into movies which engage people enough that some people sat there and watched them five times over in a day, just because they were so interested in what was happening. Um, and that's the kind of um, showy, engaging, public facing, look what we're doing stuff. And the other people who are very good at this is NASA. If you've ever seen a NASA picture of a galaxy coming off a telescope that looks beautiful and colourful, that is nothing like the data that comes off a telescope. It's boring <laughs> and grey and they, they have a whole team of artists around this. So we have a set of tools. I don't know what that means, but other than the other that colour. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that might help you. So for colour in particular, there are standard tools you can pull down and run and will give you a breakdown of what the different types of colour deficiency will see or not see in your visualisation. You don't have to guess, you can run a tool and it will tell you if it will work or not. There are other tools <coughs> which analyse crowding visualisations. Is your visualisation crowded? Uh, it won't tell you if it's too crowded, but it will give you feedback on where it's crowded. You can decide if it works. And there are other tools which will tell you about the saliency in a picture. And then you can look at the saliency plot for your visualization. And if the most salient thing in your visualization isn't the data in your message, but the axes or the grid lines or the title, you might want to redo that. So those kind of things exist uh, and could be built into much more communication going forward. Um, uh, and if you're really doing critical command and control visualizations, do, do test them. It's really quite easy to test globally now online, even if you don't do what I did, which was run them physically in Australia and Switzerland. Okay. Marvellous and excellent to time. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you very much. First thing to say is I really, really wish we'd had this meeting three years ago. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think a lot of things would have happened differently and better had that happened. Why didn't it happen? What, what was going on in the science communication field that hadn't, we hadn't had meetings? That's, that's something. That's something to think about. I know exactly what I was doing precisely three years ago today, this morning. I was composing a long, probably too long, email to the Chief Medical Officer of Scotland saying, my last email to you three days ago, you haven't really responded properly and you have a big, big problem coming. I'm trying to spell out what that was. 
At the same time, two names who have been flashed on the screen several times the last few days, uh, Jeremy Farrar and Neil Ferguson, are doing exactly the same thing with Patrick Lannett and Chris Whitty, trying to get officialdom in the UK to take cognizance of what we knew was a really big problem on the horizon. That's, that's January the 24th. We, we, we knew this mid-January. We were giving them rough estimates of numbers of deaths, the, 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 the effect of the death rate, number of the attack rate, all that sort of thing, even at that. Very rough, obviously, but trying to get across that this was a, going to be a very, very big problem for them. Didn't work at all, did it? Uh, the World Health Organization describes February 2020 as the lost month, a month where not much happened around the world. There was not a tremendous gearing up of the pandemic response. There was not the sudden production of PPE, uh, the acceleration of PCR test production. None of this was happening. Just waiting. We knew what was coming, but nothing much happened. I'm an epidemiologist, so I work at the University of Edinburgh. I'm an academic. I use models, I use stats, I use genomics, I use all sorts of quantitative tools because epidemiology is a quantitative subject, all, all the things from here to here. I also, because I've been in the business a while, I use experience. And I don't think that should be underplayed. Uh, COVID-19, amazingly, was not the first epidemic in the UK or pandemic. We, we've had AIDS. We, we've had BSE. Uh, we've had swine flu. Um, we've had all these, and we've learned all sorts of things that, again, have been talked about in this room for the last two days. We, 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 we knew a lot of this stuff, but for some reason, in 2020, we seem to forget it again. Uh, my roles in the pandemic, like many people in this room as well, well, I'm an academic, I'm a researcher. Well, I know how to communicate the results of research. I try and publish in Nature and Science, and then other scientists notice it and read it and act on it. That, we all know how to do that. Got a little difference in 2020 because we did the same thing via preprint. Harder to get a preprint notice, but uh, nonetheless, uh, that was important. But I was also ended up as an advisor, sitting on SPYMO, which um, Tom gave a lovely introduction to earlier, and Scottish COVID-19 advisory group. Sage for Scotland, basically. So, so this is not that. I also, like many other scientists, did a lot of media work. Uh, and somehow in all that, I also wrote a book about the pandemic, having discovered that media work was potentially... Um, so I decided to take the paper to the next one. If you want to insist or inform policy, inform the public debate, I think that's the bit of formal and simple thing rather than the long one. Just act on this and the other thing. And that does more than happen in the other way of other hearing the bar. Uh, it's just the sort of politician uh, sort of way of doing it. Um, so that, that was a bit of easy. Um, point I've learned from all this, uh, well, one of them is uncertainty rates go down. Uh, I remember doing a little science media thing. Very, very difficult to predict that far ahead. We knew what was going to happen in the next few weeks. Let's say something sensible does about that in the end. Let's say eight months into the future, no, very, very difficult. Amazingly, the news for everybody, very, very heavy on the news for everybody, did not write a headline that day that said, University of Edinburgh scientists don't know what will happen to the pandemic. <laughs> they went with other trajectories that were a lot more definite and a lot more alarming. scientific thing that you can really check. Something that happens really fast. I'm not sure what's coming out of the crisis in the next couple of centuries. But not all of it was. Um, so can I say something that grew of the rationale for that first lockdown? I think I have one or two more minutes. But um, half a million people have died. They were all out there. But the three businesses that have been hit were all at risk. All of us are equally at risk of the virus. 
take them to Jesus. The epidemic will be over in weeks. One of the options is that all of them pointing in the same direction, all of these cases to lockdown, they were all wrong, and we weren't out there to let them. I think we should have been. And I don't know what the CDC would have made if we had to take them to the to make them the same decision. Now, at least they would have been done on the basis of evidence and understanding. They were. They were based on the political data on the basis of the fairy tale. They're completely wrong information, and that's what drove the public view, it's what drove the politicians' view, it's what drove the other But you have introduced uh, a note of uh, disagreement, which I approve of, but it's in the public. So I'm looking forward to some good, civil, and polite weather in the afternoon. So, Sarah, you have the final say on the panel, and then we'll get to the next. So, I'm Sarah Rasmussen, I'm a UKRI fellow at the University of Cambridge Department of Criminal Justice and Mathematical Statistics. And in 2021 to 2021, I took a sabbatical at the Institute for Advanced Public Attention. So, I experienced the pandemic first from the United States and from England. And I think the reason I was asked to join this panel is because of the fact checking and science communication that I provided. So, unlike the other panelists here, um, this would not ordinarily be my job description. I'm a pure mathematician and I've been technology and jazz as a way of my kind of photography. But I ended up doing a, a temporary career shift since I you know, as someone with a great impact in trying to choose what work I do, I didn't have teaching applications. So um, and I was very concerned about the pandemic. So I uh, worked initially mostly on fact checking work as I was sort of learning more about Reality and how um, in, in public health, uh, in a public health conference, to, to work on more relatively research and to do more detailed science communication. So um, I had some background in science communication with children, it, which is a little bit different. So I, um, in uh, high school, I ran a mathematics service class where we did outreach to the schools of the Brooklyn Enterprise outreach program to, to children with Mary. Um, I also did a program of the science outreach program to the nurses, the teenagers that I had great professors and graduates, great home parents that I had. Um, and I had some background in uh, biomathematical modeling and um, biomathematics because I started out as an applied mathematician um, in my undergraduate training and then um, in I had some internships in the medical engineering and also had been a little bit better at pursuing uh, pure mathematics and physics. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the science communication and, and fact checking that I did, um, it, it, you know, so some of the facts, it, so, so one of the reasons I did is I felt like there was sort of a, an unfilled niche for it because most of the people who are experts working uh, on pandemics were very busy generating original research and there wasn't a lot of time to sort of uh, notice that there were problems in a, a newspaper comparing two fractions that, that didn't, uh, you know, couldn't be compared. For example, you see people who say, in context A, I have this number that came from published, and in context B, I have this number that came from incidents, and uh, the first number is bigger than the second number, therefore there's no virus circulating in the first number. And it's kind of a thing that doesn't work that way. Um, you know, these things are comparable. Or, or sometimes there's just be more objective problems, like somebody would cite some new source and pull out some number for it, and it pull up the wrong number. Um, or, but, but sometimes it was more subtle than that. Sometimes it was a problem with certainty in the way that they measured. So there would be some vastly underpowered study that would, you know, detect some tiny effect, but it wouldn't be significant because it was vastly underpowered. And then it would be reported on as there was no evidence that whatever. And then politicians would repeat over and over again, there was no evidence that whatever, and then uh, uses to leverage whatever policy decisions they were making. Um, and so. One of the things with the fact checking I did in addition to corresponding directly with authors or, or um, the content of journals and newspapers was uh, working with the Office of Statistics Regulation, who were amazing. Usually when you contact somebody with a complaint about something, their job is to say, we're very sorry that you feel unhappy about blah, 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 please go away. Right. But this place was amazing. They, they really engaged. They had meetings with us. They, they seemed happy that, you know, that I was pointing out places I found and, and they, they issued useful um, letters to sort of amplify um, you know, these mistakes that I found or, 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 or things that were in newspapers in a way that, that, that they really appreciated. Um, 
the, the, the science communication aspect that I did that was not that technical, was more um, things like explaining certain parameters that were relevant in epidemiology and explaining kind of limitations of how those are modeled and trying to give a sense of how they were modeled and give a sense also of how those affected the, the course of the pandemic and how they very interesting to try to explain how they are. I tried to clarify misunderstandings if they arose. I think it would be helpful to go and look and see whether there's some negative vaccine efficacy estimates coming out from the UK that are because of the way that the NIMS database is used for reporting different populations that are using the vaccine for vaccine injections. And people who are concerned about this and have tried to explain that no, these, these vaccines weren't causing you to get more sick. It was just the way that we could have concluded and it was an artifact of the problem. Um, uh, okay. um, yeah. So I think another way that uh, uncertainty can be a problem is when experts uh, underestimate the ability of the population or, or, or the public to to cope with uncertainty. So they'll make a best guess of what the scientific consensus is or something, and they say, this is what is true. And then a few weeks later, it turns out that that wasn't true. And then there's this huge lack of, uh, it really undermines trust in the expertise of the public body. CDC has trouble with it in America. It was like, if you get vaccinated, you won't be able to transmit disease. And, um, and then, you know, that turned out not to be true, uh, but it, um, it, it caused a lot of problems because there were people saying, you know, we were willing about this act, this is actually, how can we trust that you're right about the other act, how can we trust that? So I think, you know, one of the, one of the things I learned is that the, the way that we talk about uncertainty and the way we leverage uncertainty um, and the way we trust the public's ability to cope with uncertainty uh, is, is very important in terms of uh, how we communicate what we want to do to the public. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Sarah. So we have... Uh, we have over half an hour, about 40 minutes to have a discussion, which is good. At the end, I will come back to all of you and give you another bit of insight to that, so you can get the final word. And um, anything that you think of in the course that is not yet answered, you can you can bring it at the end. So just before we all leave. Uh, but meanwhile, do, can I just ask a technical question? If people think that they don't have this microphone, can they say the word on the screen and on the recording? Yes, they can. Just about. Just, if you speak loudly. Okay, cool. So it's just to say, because this is the one <laughs> non interferable microphone, just to say me passing it the length of the way. So who would like to who would like to say something? Okay, we've got a uh, we'll hand right at the back and then one here. So we'll start with you and then we'll come to you. Off you go. Hi, uh, Kate um, Oh, Sorry, can I just say, can you, when you speak, if you stand up, and, uh, and yeah, if you'd like to say your name, unless you're incognito, that also helps. But just shout. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very much not incognito. Kit Yates, um, <laughs> University of Bath. <coughs> um, Mark, I agreed with, uh, with a lot of what you had to say. Um, the one thing I disagreed with was um, with the idea that um, I think you're referring to Neil Ferguson's Imperial College Report 9 modelling projections of half a million people dying if we have not changed any behaviour quarter of a million people dying if we continued under the current mitigation strategy, referring to that as a, as a fairy tale. Usually when, when I talk about modelling, I say, you know, feel free to disagree with the results of a model if you disagree with the assumption. Given that, you know, 210,000 people have died with COVID on the death certificate, despite three lockdowns, despite vaccines coming in in late 2020, what aspect of Neil Ferguson and Imperial College's modelling is it that makes you think that it was a fairy tale? Or rather than the fact that we, we took into and it became a self-defeating prophecy. That, yeah. Uh, okay, great and specific point. If you just hold that and, and come back to you. Uh, uh, where was the hat? Yes? You think, again, if you can stand up and share. Alan Newton, yeah? Listening to Mark talking about COVID and how the government didn't listen throughout February, and it's a big crisis, trying to convey messages to the public and uncertainty. Um, <coughs> in my own work, we are involved with energy, and that links into net zero and climate change, and I wondered if there's any learning to be had the other way around, 
feels like we've been in the February stage for many years. <laughs> People are slowly catching on, but communicating uncertainty to the public and actions needing to be taken. What can we learn from COVID? Great, and a great question to everybody. What what can we learn from this to take through other crises? But, um, but the idea of a perpetual February is really hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. <laughs> hang on. Hold on. Uh, I knew it was really good to have you. I can slap you really shut you. Uh, obviously, I want to slap you. Terrible. Uh, okay, so hand there, and then I will come back to the panel, and then I'll come back again. Uh, Jeremy Coleman. Uh, we've been talking about uncertainty, uh, but some of what has occurred has been uh, not just uncertainty, but ignorance. So, for example, right at the beginning, we didn't know, we, the populace, including ministers and civil servants, didn't know what things were relevant to measure. So you're not uncertain about what the measurement said, but are you actually measuring the right thing? So how do we deal with ignorance as well as uncertainty? Great question. Fantastic. So I'm going to let you come in first, Mark, since the first one was directed directly to you, but feel free also to respond to the other three points. And then I will come back to the, the rest of you if you're good. Sure, thanks. I'll, I'll just answer the first one and then maybe others want to, want to come in. Um, it was a package of statistics I was referring to when I used the phrase fairy tale. Um, and actually, the 500k figure is probably the least fairy tale like aspect of that. And you're quite right. The caveats were there in the in report nine, about 500, it was actually 510,000 if you want to be honest, in that report, um, but they still fail to emerge into the public discourse. And, and I know this because I was having to fend off reporter after reporter wanting to know about this half million deaths. So, so it absolutely did get there. And Imperial College and everyone else failed to stop that happening. We did. We did. Um, I, I, I take all the caveats that you there. But the other two were worse. So we're all equally at risk. That was Michael Gove. And that was on the back, and you, hopefully people in this room know this scandal, if you want to call it that, that Spy B, the Advisory Committee on Behaviour of Peter and Sage, felt there was going to be some problem with people cooperating on, with lockdown because a large proportion of the population might not feel sufficiently threatened by the virus. And so they advocated, advocated that the government should strengthen its messaging, I'm paraphrasing here, <laughs> but to induce fear in a large portion of the population that didn't think they were at risk, much at risk, because they weren't. Uh, it, uh, I find this absolutely shocking that this happened, and so do many other people. And yet we didn't correct it, collectively, as a field. And then the, the, probably the most insidious of all was this idea that it was over in a few weeks, that if we all knuckled down together and got through a lockdown, you know, as collective uh, activity, that would be the end of the matter, the thing would be over. And I think I certainly would absolutely support the strictest possible lockdown if that were true. We knew it wasn't true. We'd known that wasn't going to be the case since February. We had already submitted briefings to government showing the second wave. Never mind the first, and even the third. We, we knew this was going to last two years, or more. We absolutely knew that, and we didn't communicate it. So I, 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 do, I do think putting those together, I don't think fairy tale is too strong. These, these were not true pieces of understanding and evidence, and yet they were used not only to build policy, but for more public opinion. I'm really upset about that. I don't think that should have happened. I think that's, I think that's the biggest failure of science communication I can think of in my lifetime, and we're here to fix it. Let's, let's do that. And, and I think that answer reveals that, as well as disagreements about specific models and specific numbers, which I'm pretty sure we all know, there is also this wider question of what is the job of communicating statistics, especially in a crisis? Uh, how, do you, how do you reconcile back to government saying, look, we want this message to go out because we want to make people do the thing we want them to do, versus perhaps the wider duty, which uh, the Grove was talking about yesterday, to bring to the whole public as wide a picture as possible so that people can make their, their informed decisions. So uh, all of you, feel free to chip in on and any or all of those. Do you want to do? Okay. Uh, I'd like to pick up on the point about uh, being stuck in a perpetual February of um, thinking about uh, 
climate and, and net zero and so on, and not reaching the sunlit uplands of, of March. Um, and we asked, you asked uh, what, uh, what lessons there were from the experience of, of, of the pandemic. Well, um, I'm going to sort of answer that question slightly obliquely, but it, it, might, it might help get you to an answer. So I worry that in government, the wrong lessons have been learned from the success, what I would call the success, of the first two examples I gave of, of uh, communication. I talked about the dashboard, and I talked about the daily press briefings. And I think in and around government, it's become clear to senior officials, and, and I think politicians, that it's quite cool, it looks quite cool, it's a good look to have some data under your arm, uh, and I think they get that. Um, having data is sort of something that you can surround yourself with. So if you go within government now, uh, everybody's got a dashboard. There are dashboards everywhere. Uh, and uh, I think the idea is that if, if only you can interrogate and scrutinize and squeeze the dashboard out, the answer will emerge. But of course, what we all know is that a dashboard is not the same as evidence, and it's certainly not the same as kind of insight on which you can take action. And moreover, it's the wrong lesson from the pandemic, because this, the, the, the thing which I celebrate, and I gave my, my star rating, wasn't the existence of dashboards, or the provision of evidence into the hands of decision makers, it was the completely transparent and open uh, ability uh, of, of the population to access and engage with those data. This was not an, it's not an elite sport, it's, 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 a, it's a totally popular uh, sport. And that lesson has not, not been learned. We're not awash with government dashboards on things uh, which, are, uh, which are trustworthy, um, which are uh, engage and listen, um, my, my, my second criteria, and which are um, confidently uncertain. So I think the wrong lessons might be being learned, which I think is a tragedy, because the lesson is so, to me is so obvious that that is a great way to address any policy challenges with this, with this spirit of openness and engagement and, 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 uh, 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 and transparency. So I don't know if that gets you to the answer, but it's certainly the lesson that I draw from the pandemic. Fantastic. Um, I, I guess it's I just briefly maybe amplify the, the last point about the, the importance of data transparency. I mean, I think there were a lot of useful insights that developed in the pandemic from people who didn't have uh, access to, to, to special channels of data and were relying on public domain data, um, even people who were not necessarily experts but who were able to sort of leverage their own mathematical or, or uh, you know, other types of expertise to, to, to come up with insights from the data that was available. And in some contexts, the, the shortage of available data was, was a challenge for that. So I think um, I, I think if there were sort of, it, the, the dashboard was absolutely amazing. And I think if, you know, the, the, the more data, the better in terms of having the public be able to engage with and, um, and develop new insights from the the data, in, especially in the context of, of global emergency. Fantastic. And uh, Nick, I don't know if you'd like to pick up on this thing of uh, uncertainty and then the, the meta question of not even knowing what it is you should be asking to, to find out. Just to, just to throw you the biggest philosophical curveball of the morning. Is that with no warning at all. Epistemic uncertainty or planetary uncertainty, someone can tell me. Um, so uh, on uncertainty, I mean, it's uh, so it's one of the grand challenges internationally in visualization research at the moment to <coughs> present uncertainty in new ways, so that it's easier to understand. Um, uh, and there are different uh, directions you can come at this from. One, what, one is that people naturally um, shy away from uncertainty; they're not interested in engaging with it because it's a thing that is uncertain, and they really want things that are certain. Um, and there are so few mathematicians in the world that people who understand what a variance is or what a standard deviation is are very rare. 80% uh, of the population doesn't have a GCSE in maths in this country. They're barely going to understand a line graph, so they're not going to start to understand uncertainty. So my work over the last five years or so has been to quite rigorously start at a very base level and try and understand new representations of information that we can then apply to uncertainty and represent uncertainty as a, a, an inherent part of visualization to do in the future. So we've got to a point where we've got some things we're trying out, and in a few years' time we may, may have new ways of addressing that. 
Um, it, it, it's certainly far from a solved problem. Um, but what I think the characteristics of the things we need are very simple visual representations that clearly contain two variables. And we know that as soon as you have people from the psychologist, as soon as people try and look at things with two variables, it pretty much halves the rate at which they can process information. So it's really quite a tricky thing. Um, so we've got to sort of slip it in there without you noticing. But have it there so that you see it and can refer to it. <coughs> Just to pick up on the energy thing, um, the climate community ha has had several disasters with communicating things over the years. Uh, and there are numerous reports recently and not so recently on how that came about uh, and how they're, they're taking a much more positive approach to communication these days. Um, you can find those all, all, all over the place. And I think well worth looking at. I would say energy is something I've moved on to uh, visualizing uh, fairly routinely now. And there isn't enough data, the transparent data thing is missing. We really need a lot more data on it out there. Um, but people are interested in it. So if we can get more data, they will, they're, they're very interested in the sources of data and the source of electricity generation. It, it, it surprised me, but people <coughs> didn't realize quite how variable wind is, um, just in the rate and the fact that yesterday we had energy warnings coming out. We didn't know. We're also working with the National Control Center in um, working where well, there's a different problem. The, the, the sheer number of new sources of energy mean that the controllers of the national grid are starting to struggle to be able to control our power supplies. And they're saying that actually, in the not too distant future, we're going to have to get used to electricity and not being always there. And we'll have to have new ways to, to control that. So, so it's an important point, and if you want a new challenge, I think there's, there, we need a lot more data, much more transparent data from industry and government on that. Um, yeah, so lots of learn from climate already, and, and definitely a thing going forward that we need data. And there is an appetite for it, you can find it. Great, okay, back out to you. Okay, so there's a hat, oh, two hands. Oh, I see it's all kicking off now. Good, excellent. So we'll start there at the back, and then go along there, and then we'll start to people. Oh, yes. Uh, hi, I'm Jacob Smith, I'm here at Cambridge. I have uh, a comment inspired by you, and uh, a question for uh, discussion, because I would really like to see the same. So first, I think comments are that, from my work on pandemic and from everybody else's, is that it's something that science needs to communicate well, I think, is that science is not static. So at the beginning, we did not know a lot of variables about the COVID. We did not know if it's asymptomatic, how much asymptomatic spread there is. But we knew that those would be important variables to think of, uh, how easy uh, or how hard it would be to control uh, a disease. So I think this is also important to kind of come through when you're communicating with the public and that, you know, the state of the science what is true or what the best evidence today is might not be the same as what best evidence is next week and therefore uh, advice uh, might change. And in fact, it did change, right? Uh, reflect that. Uh, uh, so that's, this is a comment. And uh, one thing that I would really like uh, everybody's opinion on is that, you know, we've heard about climate change. It has a very different time scale than the pandemic. Uh, so, you know, dust boats don't necessarily make so much sense to change uh, and also what it doesn't make uh, so much uh, motivation for a politician is that certain feedback will operate on the time scale beyond the lifetime of a politician right mm -hmm. so there is not this sense of urgency that uh, we need policy to do something about it because it's not in my uh, political time scale uh, however I think pandemic and climate change and a lot of problems are not so much problems of science, they are problems of governance, right? We are, we are often told as individuals, you know, you need to recycle, you need to m monitor your energy consumption, uh, but as an individual, yeah, that will be, have a cumulative effect, but it's not going to be as effective as a government issuing a tax or a guidance or a new regulation about uh, energy. So what can we, my sort of invitation for discussion is, what role can scientists play uh, more generally than just my position, in, in, in kind of contributing to uh, governance or uh, outcomes uh, over shorter time scales, so that you know we avert catastrophes of climate change for our kids, right? So some, some, some of these problems will be intergenerational problems, and I want to make sure that my kids uh, have a nice life. How can we, what, or is there a role that 
time and place to do that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so this sets off a huge new topic, which would probably be enough for a conference in itself. Uh, so, uh, Tim Wapple on the back row. <laughs> Hello. Um, I, so I, think, I think Mark's going to know what I'm going to say because we chatted about it last night. Um, I should say, first of all, Mark was one of the most useful sources I had in the pandemic and always very, very clearly spoke about the um, modelling for me, uh, which I'm very grateful. And, I, and I'm not just saying that because I'm going to slightly disagree with him. Um, <laughs> the, I think the 500,000 is a really interesting case study in scientific miscommunication and misinformation. And I'd be interested to know what people think could have been done differently. And so to give you my, I, I've just looked through the front pages of every newspaper in the country from March the 17th, 2020. That figure did not appear, not, not even in paragraphs, it, it was not in a single newspaper. Um, we all used the 260,000 figure. And I was in the press conference with Neil Ferguson, and someone asked, who is this figure of 500,000 on you know, page whatever, should we use it? And they said no. Um, now, the first time, so I, I, don't, I, I, just, I don't think that did the play in quality at all, um, but I accept it is now, the, that was the 500,000 paper. And the first time I heard that was probably in the summer of 2020, and I was slightly confused when people were sort of abusing me on social media, saying, you know, you're, you're a Ferguson lover with this 500,000, and I just hadn't seen this figure. I had to dredge back through my memory. Now, we've all got different experiences of the pandemic, but it does feel to me that there's an element in which we've retrospectively changed history. And it's only that I've got the recording of that press conference on my phone and am able to look through the, uh, the front pages. So I, I sort of don't disagree with Mark that that, that 500,000 has become a thing. I don't know what anyone at all could have done short of not having the implausible upper output of the model in the academic paper with a caveat saying this will never happen, which is what, what, what it basically said, um, for it not to turn into a public history. Okay, great. This is going to rumble on, which I like. Uh, so a couple of hands down here. Stand up clearly. So, okay. <coughs> Rowan, and then I'm uh, going to come down to you, and then I will come back to the panel, then I'll just do another round. So, Rowan, off you go. Okay, yeah, so this is, this is more on the same, actually, the stuff from um, Mark and, and Kit. Uh, I just wanted to think about um, about the bits that did sound like lies, so that it'll be over in weeks, <laughs> and the, it will affect everyone equally. Um, and just wanted to ask you, as as communicators, what what you think is going on there. I think Mark, you have a very very clear view. I, I, I can imagine the behavioural scientists defending this, saying, "Look, we were trying to save lives. Sometimes you can lie to someone to save their own life." Um, and that does seem right. That sometimes maybe you can. Maybe that's justified. I don't know. That's a, a really tough philosophical question about well-being versus autonomy or something like that and how you fit them together. Um, but I suppose there are two things I wanted to, to say. So what, one is that I think in the context of government, if you do that, you have to recognise you're making your government illegitimate. You're turning it into brute power. And brute power might, might still be justified to save lots of lives that are otherwise, <laughs> otherwise going to be lost. Um, but you've got to be bloody sure that it will. And... So what was the, going to Nick's point about web evidence, what was the evidence that the behavioural scientists would bring? What's, what's the evidence that it was absolutely necessary to, to get a change that was really going to save lots of lives? Was there much appeal to, to evidence there, a sense that we're going to lie and we know why we're lying because it's the only way we can, we can save a total disaster? Um, was there that sort of thinking going on? Because if not, then, then that, that's the problem. <laughs> We, we, we may not have the people. No, we may not have the people. That, but that <laughs> well, would be I wondered if Mark had any insights on it. So, uh, so yes, first person there, and then I will come back out again after I've let the panel go. Fine. Uh, so, from Department of Health and Social Care, um, I guess I had a question around how what we can do about communicating this and helping people understand this, because it kind of feels like you can't win. Um, if you communicate the uncertainty, then people will sometimes, some people in the media, on social media especially, will point to and go, listen, they don't know what they're talking about, there's this massive range of emotions, they don't know, they don't know what they're saying. And if you don't communicate it well enough, then we're not being honest about the actual uncertainty. And, you know, there's a lot of cherry picking of kind of like people picking out the upper ranges of data and things and saying, oh yeah, we're going to make 100 billion from doing this, when you say, no, it's going to be like 20 to 100 billion, but that's not an accurate representation. So I guess some, and then sometimes you can be kind of, yeah, hunger and drawn and courted, I suppose, by your uncertainty because 
if you communicate a model or something and someone then, it, it turns out not to be the case that it's gone exactly as planned, people come back and say, oh, they didn't know what they were talking about. And it feels that you can't really win. So I guess the question is, how can we stop uncertainty being weaponized by the media and by people on social media? Very good and excellent specific question. Uh, can I start with the next one, Dick? Thank you. Um, I was saying one thing about the 500,000. By the time that 500,000 bit of modelling came up, Imperial, I'd stopped listening to them because Neil Ferguson had destroyed his own reputation earlier on in the pandemic for me. Um, and, the, and, 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 and it became transparent that the government was pushing out modelling results immediately before policy the next day. So I, I, that was where I was at that time. But it's not my area of deep expertise. So, In terms of the uncertainty, um, yeah, I think yeah, I think the answer is yes. There are things we can do, uh, and uh, it requires us to find new ways to normalise uncertainty as a part of communication and visualisation and other um, processes. Uh, the CIA did a study on this in the 1960s, in fact, and they they worked out it was better to put it into words than in numbers. So that's one way to do it. The things we're working on at the moment are to create more simplified representations of it that don't necessarily mean that you have to publish all of the range of modeling. And in fact, it's similar to some work on hurricane modeling in the US where they're working out that in fact, pushing forward the most likely tracks with a range of uncertainty around that is better than saying, here's all the tracks that are models. Because people were then picking the least likely tracks and the worst cases are the things that are locked onto. Uh, so there are new ways that we might come up with it, but it needs to be a more normal thing in communication and science all the time, rather than just in one off in a pandemic. Lovely, thank you. Sarah, over to you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the uncertainty is part of the message, and um, I think if, if we sort of collectively worked at changing the culture of, of, of how people accept the idea of uncertainty in uh, in data communication, um, and, and we worked at sort of uh, working as hard at communicating about the uncertainty as we did about the actual result, then, then perhaps there wouldn't be quite as much misunderstanding about what the uncertainty means and, and how we interpret it. Um, because sometimes the uncertainty is, is one of the, the big parts of the message. On the, on the other hand, some, uh, sometimes the uncertainty is an artifact of how you collected your data and how you modeled it. So sometimes you have more uncertainty than you ought to just because you did a bad job. Um, and so, you know, I, I think also people, uh, you know, it, understanding what the source of uncertainty is and what type of uncertainty it means is important. I mean, there are a lot of different types of uh, uncertainty we can have, and sometimes people have credible intervals just for their model, where you can have a very tight interval because your model was only capable of modeling some very tight thing, but your model, uh, the, the specification of your model has huge uncertainty relative to, you know, whether it was a correct model for, uh, structurally for the thing you were modeling. And so, um, it, that, that doesn't actually represent the, the uncertainty of what might happen. It just represents the uncertainty of, of how well your model could calculate the thing it wanted to calculate. Um, so, uh, I, these, these ideas are hard, and um, I, I think communicating hard mathematical ideas is, is hard, but it's, it's worth doing. Um, I don't know if I have any well-evidenced uh, advice on what the best ways are to, to communicate it, but I think it's something that that should be, that more effort should be invested in finding ways to communicate that to the public. I feel like we're, we're, we're starting a campaign. What do we want? More uncertainty! Yeah. When do we want it? Within a reasonably plausible time frame? <laughs> Just to go back to the thing about um, uh, lies, I think someone's talking about. Um, there's an interesting psychological condition that if you're told a fact which you then learn is untrue, mm. you will forget that it's a lie sooner than you forget the fact. So the fact will stay in your mind a lot longer. And um, so it is quite a, a complicated thing to put out lies because people remember the lie long after they've forgotten it was a lie. Hi, a very um, brief response to Sophie's excellent question about communicating uncertainty. Uh, I, uh, where are you? I'm in private. Okay. Hi. I think that um, I'm not sure I accept the premises of the question that we face a choice between being honestly uncertain and being trusted. And I think the emerging empirical evidence actually suggests that you, you know we can have our cake and eat it to, to use that to use that phrase. 
Um, but even if I do accept the premises of your question and we face that trade-off, I think we should all collectively prefer to be in a world where we are honestly uncertain and people slightly rubbish us than we go with something we know isn't right for the sake of popular acceptability. As I say, I don't accept the trade-off, but if we had to, I'd plump for being honestly uncertain. <coughs> Can I just come back to Jeremy Coleman's question? Because I, I felt uh, sorry, Jeremy, that I, I didn't give an answer to it, and I'm afraid I've not been listening to everybody else's question, because it's a hard one, and it's <laughs> taking me this long to get to this rather loose answer. My rather loose answer is, I think in sort of terms of um, epistemic you know, structure, you're right, there is a sharp distinction between ignorance, uh, and then uncertainty uh, about what you what you know. I think in practical terms, though, in situations like this, there's much more of a of a sort of a uh, an iterative dance, whereby you begin not knowing very much. You begin to flesh that out with some more insight and evidence that that casts a little bit of a of a canvas. Then you get some more evidence and you update and you update and and you know I'm. I'm offering a slightly loose Bayesian idea of how these things practically work. I think logically you are correct though, there is a sharp distinction between those two things. Thank you. Let's say a mark here, but don't say that about I'll try not to. <laughs> 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 uh, question at the back, science, science isn't static. So, very true, I remember having a conversation with a, a very senior minister in the Scottish government, uh, pointing out exactly that, that our advice could change. This, this was a very reasonable minister who completely got it, totally understood that, but came back with, yes, but if that requires a change in policy, we're going to be accused of flip-flopping and U-turning. So there's a genuine difficulty for, for the politicians there. Uh, and I suppose the ideal would be not to get them into that position at all. Because if, if we're changing our minds, that's because we were initially wrong. So it would be quite good not to be initially wrong. Maybe we should have been more uncertain at the beginning. Anyway, that, that was it. Um, the, uh, the idea that we have to respond to, well, we did have to respond to a crisis. It's an opportunity for a politician. Prevention for politicians, to me, sells less well. If you're doing a really good job at preventing pandemics, there are no pandemics. There's no crisis to manage. They, they don't rise up into the, uh, they don't become visible in that way. And, and the only field I can think of, I'm sure there are many more that you can think of, that has cracked that problem is anti-terrorism. Where they have absolutely cracked it. They, they, we don't want anything to happen with terrorism, and we invest an enormous amount of money and resources into making sure it doesn't happen. Why on earth can't we do that for climate change? Why can't we do it for pandemics? Mm -hmm. So they've cracked it, but we, we haven't, I don't think. Um, oh, 500k, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. <laughs> um, uh, there's, there's an underlying issue with the 500k that kept on going, which is one of the reasons I'm cross about it which is the assumption in quite a lot of the models that the only driver of behavioural change in the population was what the government said, whether it was law or advice. And clearly that wasn't true, and that led to an awful lot of misleading output, starting with the 500k, but it had a long and distinguished history after that, in, sorry, undistinguished history uh, after that. Uh, so, uh, uh, on the thing about not uh, being economical with the truth in order to save lives, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm dead against it. And one of the reasons I'm dead against it is because you have to be awfully sure you're right yeah. in what advice you're giving. Now, the advice that Spy D gave they were, was, a, was a direct call for lockdown, basically, for, for locking down the whole population, rather than concentrating the response on a small minority, 5, 10, 15 percent, depending on how you define it who were at massively increased risk. And what got lost in the idea that we all had to solve this collectively was the idea that we should protect those people more. Now, who, what, who, who, who benefited most from lockdown? Well, ironically, one of the groups that benefited least from lockdown was that very vulnerable group. So me and Chris Robertson at Strathclyde did some sums on this in the summer of 2020 about the first wave. Somewhere in our estimation, between 50 and, three, 50 and 75 percent of the deaths that occurred during that first wave, by definition vulnerable people, who got infected during lockdown. During. Massive proportion of the deaths of people getting infected during lockdown. Why? Because these are very vulnerable people. They're elderly, they're frail, they're infirm, they've got comorbidities. They cannot not interact with others. 
They have to interact with carers. They have to interact with social care. They have to interact with health care. They have to go to hospital or to primary care. They have no choice. Lock lockdown didn't do a great job of protecting those people. We would have done much, much better, in my view, if we'd really had a concerted effort to try and protect the people. And, and Spy B's advice detracted, in my view, from that goal, because they thought that controlling it for everybody was the best thing to do, and I don't think it was. You have to be really sure you're right when you're not telling the truth. Okay, now we're cantering towards lunchtime, and I don't want to delay lunch, <laughs> I can avoid it. So, what I'm going to do is, everyone from the floor wants to say something, I'm going to take you all, please be pithy, and then I will come back and give the panel the final word. Now, so before we start, I saw a hands at the end there, I think, yes, and, and in front of you. So, so I'm going to take you two, and then come over here. So if you want to speak, stick your hand up there so I can see you. Oh, it was new ones coming up. Okay, so I'm going to take you two, and then move across this way. So you, you behind, and then you in front. Yes, you. <laughs> Susie Abzer, DFGL. Um, so I had a question, it's sort of directed at a piece that Nick was talking about, with um, representing uncertainty via grassroots organisations and stuff. Um, so we've been doing some work with the Lincoln Centre on how to um, convey uncertainty through visualisations. Um, and so I did have a question, because one of the things that came up with um, the visualisations we tested with the public was, um, they really liked them and they found them trustworthy and they engaged with them quite well. But when it came to digging into their comprehension, they didn't actually understand what was being shown to them that well. Um, so I was wondering whether um, how important um, you and anyone on the panel thinks it is to actually have um, representations of uncertainty and graphics that are immediately understandable or whether there's any sort of um, remit to just having not exactly training on how to understand it, but more kind of text and explanations alongside the graph. Okay, excellent, pithy question. So in front of you, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, uh, oh no. Um, climate change is felt the last decade, decades already. Severe weather, so drought, flood, heat waves, those, are, those have intensified. So that, that's actually the way to, to, when the government knows that, to actually say the, the, the government. So, but in all those cases, <coughs> for may say we add the pandemic, the same issue crops up that it, that is difficult for the expert to to, to, to maybe reach the government. Uh, that's not something from today. I'm familiar with flood modeling, and if you look over the centuries, you can probably go back to the year thousand in the Netherlands. It seems that after a big disaster, there was action. If you look at most of those cases, you can find that experts, whoever the experts were at the time, had warned the government, but for some reason, there was no action because the region thought, is the economy stupid? So there seems to be a tendency in humans, I think including the decision makers, because they are humans too, to, 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 to forget about disasters because we want to go on with our lives. There was actually in Laura Stingy's book, which I read in 2019, about the Spanish flu. Nothing in this pandemic surprised me after reading that book. She said people wanted to forget about the Spanish flu and therefore we don't know about it. One in seven people died of the Spanish flu in the Netherlands, something like that. So I asked, I never heard about it in my family. So I asked my father, I said, did anyone die in our family? Yeah, the sister of your grandfather, his famous, his most famous sister. So people don't want, don't want to, to know about disasters, they want to forget. So how do we deal with that human tendency for all kinds of disasters? Okay, another good question, but not as pithy. Please give me a second. Uh, so, okay, so there's that hand, uh, and then that one, and then that one. I see all these new hands going up now. Okay, so I'll go to you, and then I'll go to the back, and then I'll come to you. Just, yep. Um, so it's Martin Rowell from Rowell Center. Um, so I just wanted to ask, um, so you said that there's some kind of um, evidence that there's some kind of
this goes down very well and it's well appreciated. I just wonder whether we need to do more to bring that kind of thinking in at an earlier age so people are more equipped. I, I was also wondering whether it would help us in terms of combating our kind of two, two, of, two out of three philosophical evils that we talked about yesterday in terms of it seems to me what we need to do is equip people to know about these things rather than try to counter it because things are countering as it were. Okay, so, yeah. very good. You, if you didn't hear that, it's like, should we do more of this at an earlier age and equip people to counter things rather than have to counter them all the time? So there was a hand right at the back, yes? Thank you. Joseph Gasway from George Washington University in the States. Uh, I, uh, I want to talk about the uncertainty issue, which is very important. But I'm wondering if we could build on people's understanding of opinion polls. Most elections, everybody has heard of the margin of error in the polls. Mm -hmm. So there should be a way that we can build upon the knowledge that people have picked up to help us express uncertainty better. I'm not sure I know the answer, but I'm just going to bring that up to the other people who are more expert. And a related question in the pandemic is I have very good friend who's an expert on sample surveys, especially health surveys, who was trying to get RNIH to use the existing sample design to develop a prevalence survey, which would have been, you know, if they have unemployment rates every month, we would have prevalence information and all that. Couldn't budge it. Now, how could someone else or say, get this to the press to say, hey, it's, we're blowing it because it could extra cost is trivial compared to all the costs of lockdowns and everything else. So how would a scientist get to the press? That would be something to the press. Well, yeah, maybe you need to have a, have a talk to, to Tom over lunch. Uh, but there was, I think there was a, a similar kind of surveying thing uh, again here. So talk to one of the ONS people, maybe. Uh, so I'm, so, I'm sorry, we are rapidly running out of time now. So I'm going to, I'm sorry, your hand went up later. Uh, so I'm going to come here and then uh, let David Spiegelhalter abuse his position. <laughs> and have the last word from the audience. Hi, I'm Alice from the Wilson Center. And uh, as you can tell, I'm not from the UK. And I feel I'm, like I'm getting so much information about UK specific COVID like, scandals and secrets and numbers <laughs> that I, had, I knew nothing about. Um, so my question is more thinking more globally from that. I think specifically to Sarah, you said you experienced the um, pandemic from both the US and the UK. And I'm thinking a lot of what we're talking about is communication and something I feel like maybe I want to ask about is the cultural element of that. I think a lot of all this is very specific to England or UK or um, a specific part of the world. But as we know, the world is much, much bigger than that. and. Um, what are the cultural sort of issues, challenges, interesting tools and tricks that um, different cultures have um, that you've seen people use well? And essentially what I'm asking for is where is the cultural bit in terms of statistical and mathematical communication, uh, both in pandemics and outside of that? Excellent. And another thing that obviously requires a whole other com conference. Uh, so David, be, be pithy and brilliant. Yeah, I've just, just find the, the pedantry the half million Britons. Um, I remember discussing this on Newsnight on March the 3rd, you know, way before the Imperial Report. And if you Google coronavirus could kill half a million Britons, you get a headline in The Independent from February the 26th, 2020, based on a leaked um, government briefing of the reasonable worst case scenario. So the half million predates that March the 6th in the report nine. And it was, and it was being discussed you know, weeks before. Uh, from a leaked government report. <laughs> okay, so I'm sorry, it's technically we're over time, but so I want to give the panel a chance to come back and to give their final summing up words. So I think I'm going to take you in reverse order from what you, you started with. So say what you need to say, be pithy, and then we'll send people out to lunch with lots to think about. Okay, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll just stress the, the cultural question. So I, I, I think it is important to um, have some awareness of the the, the global context of, of local communications that we make. One way that I saw this play out in the pandemic was the way that people talked about uh, transmission in children in schools. So, for example, in the UK, there was a very um, uh, a culture of keeping the schools as open as possible to the extent that people who were immune compromised um, before vaccines were available were not allowed to keep their children home or have remote school options 
And so there was sort of some messaging from people who were advocating to have more choice about being able to protect themselves or shield if they had children at home. This messaging was then used to some extent in America in contexts where there were extremely conservative places that had totally shut down the schools and not had let their children do anything. And so there was this somehow negative feedback between these two different messaging things where people who were trying to fight against things that were happening in the UK were being used to sort of harm children who were in the US and then vice versa because there was all this feedback in the US about these children, they're in a very low prevalence situation here and they can't do anything and this is damaging to them for these reasons. And then people in the UK are saying, look at these children, they're in these damaging situations, they can't do anything, therefore we shouldn't let these people shield. So I think it's important when we communicate to try to, I mean, it's impossible to have global omniscience of what issues are going on everywhere, but to be careful about specifying the locality of the messaging that you're talking about and how it should be locally interpreted because otherwise sometimes it can be used for the wrong purposes in other places. But I think it is useful, thank you very much. Thank you. I'll talk about a cultural issue, but a different kind of culture, academic culture in this case. And this is very much my personal impression. Feel free to disagree with it. Tell me afterwards if you do. I've been in the infectious disease modeling business for 40 years or something now. And my impression is that I'm from the life sciences background. Many people involved in that subject are from a medical or life sciences background. I don't take models too seriously. I'm a biologist. I don't believe them in any deep way. I mean, they're useful guides to what might happen, but they're all sorts of other kinds of evidence. I don't take, I don't put great store by the models, even though that's mostly what I do. They're guides. I think the people in my field who come at it from a mathematics and physics background have a really different attitude. I think they believe them to a degree that I simply don't. And that bothers me. In which case, it's all your fault. You need to change. Or maybe I'm not. That's my cultural observation. Well, Nick, you're summing up the book. Okay. There's so many things I could say. I've got to be picky. Just your point. I think you probably framed your questions mathematically. And I suspect your study was flawed because of that. And I think you need to think more about what real people think about it. But we'll have to have a chat about how you framed that to do that. In terms of lies, I think they're just on a scale between lies and truth. It's more about uncertainty than it is about lies. So I think the degree of uncertainty in a thing that you want to communicate is really the key thing to think about because it may be very important to communicate very uncertain things to people to persuade them to do things. Skill training. I think this came up yesterday. I think this is a cop-out. You can't just train everybody to make them all mathematicians. It won't work. You've got to actually approach the problem and solve it. You can, of course, still do skill training, and I think there's lots of room in schools for more statistical stuff earlier. But it's a cop-out. Don't rely on it. So one last thing on AI, actually, which might help in the long run. In UK law, in court right now, if you take a computer output into court, it is by default deemed to be true, completely true. And you have to evidence how it isn't true. And that's one of the reasons the post office scandal came about, I think. But in 1999, that was made law, and you have to actually challenge it. And one of the challenges that's going to come up is AI. AI systems, anyone who's used one, have no idea what they're talking about when they create outputs. It's not even uncertainty. It's not probability. It's a sum of weightings. This might be the thing, and this might not be the thing. And that's going to seriously challenge this in-court law thing in the near future. So, yeah. That's probably the most shocking thing I've heard in two days, that computers are deemed to be true in court. We're all doomed. And on that note... Thank you. You are doomed because the microphone is in my hand. Thank you. I am an optimist, and this whole discussion leaves me very optimistic. We've heard about some quite significantly worrying things that we should be preoccupied by in the last hour and actually in the last day and a half. We've heard about things like misuse of a particular worst-case scenario 
number, we've heard about the challenges of if you communicate uncertainty, does that undermine, I don't think it does, but we've, that's, that challenge has been put up. We've heard about the challenge of, of people uh, maybe benefiting from different levels of education to help them uh, understand these matters better. So we've heard some worrying things, we've heard you know, the mega worrying thing, the meta level worrying thing, we don't really, uh, we're not confident that we have the institutional mechanisms to lock in a long-term action on climate change. Let's come up with two, two or three questions. But I'm an optimist on the basis of these great comments and your great questions, because I think what this whole event has been about is about coalescing the community of people who care enough about the communication of evidence and statistics and data um, into, beyond just being a community, but into a movement, into a coalition. Uh, and I think that's really powerful. Uh, and I think the evidence that we've seen over, over the last three years of the pandemic and into numerous subjects suggests to me that we can make progress as a community of people who care about that. So I'm really optimistic. I don't think we should be uh, uh, berating ourselves. I think we should say that we've learned some lessons. We know how to deploy them. We'll learn some more lessons. Let's march on. So we're not doomed. Hooray, <laughs> we're not doomed. Uh, it's, I'm sorry to run into lunch break. Uh, we start to get it quarter past. Uh, but I think you'll agree we had so much to talk about. We could have gone on longer. Please give a huge round of applause for our panelists.